Hi, so I'm Ross Cutts. Uh, I'm an implant practitioner based in Gloucestershire in England. Um, I've been asked by Botus today to chat to you uh, about all of the different biomaterial options that are, are available through the Botus company. Um, these range from their allografts through to their xenografts through to their alloplasts. It's a fantastic variety of different uh, biomaterials that we'll be chatting about and we'll be looking at uh, all the all the different clinical indications and trying to go through those uh, with a, a clinical edge to it. So um, I hope you enjoy the next sort of hour of, of webinar and that's good. I, let's start. All right, so um, we're going to be looking at the systematic choice of biomaterials with implant dentistry. So um, I'd like to thank Botus for the invitation to talk about their products and their product range. It's something that I, I enjoy. I enjoy using their products and I think they're, they're products I've used for probably about five or six years and they're really um, great products to use for long-term implant success. And really, you know, there is quite a big um, Choice of, select, uh, choice of materials to use, and we're going to go through that. So we're just going to look at the aims of this next 40 minutes, 45 minutes webinar, and that's to look at the different biomaterials available in the BOTUS range. And we'll see that there's quite a few to choose from. And we're going to look at uh, the biochemical properties behind them and the physical properties, because handling materials is quite important, and the way that a material handles is important. And so that you as a clinician are then hopefully armed with a bit more information about uh, an approach about choosing an appropriate biomaterial for a particular uh, implant clinical situation. And so the objective would be to have a deeper understanding of the BOTUS biomaterial range. And as we just said, you know, looking at specific clinical indications that you'll be able to choose an appropriate choice of biomaterial and have an improved understanding of the biochemical and physical properties of the BOTUS biomaterial range with their indication matrix, which I think is unique to um, a biomaterial company. that They actually have made it very straightforward for their clinicians to be able to look at this indication matrix to then choose uh, an appropriate biomaterial from. But we'll go into that in a bit more detail. And obviously to be able to know why you want to choose a certain material and when to use it. So this is me, um, I'm Ross and I'm in the UK and I'm uh, an ITI fellow, which means that I'm very geared towards evidence-based implant dentistry. I'm also heavily involved with uh, postgraduate education and I run the study clubs, the ITI study clubs for the UK and Ireland. I have a social media following or presence and um, so I'm on Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel which has a lot of uh, surgical videos on it for, of implant dentistry from very simple straightforward placements up to rather complex placements. So it's quite a useful um, resource for, for you guys to use. So why BOTUS biomaterials? So as I've said, just briefly, you know, this is the indication, this is part of the indication matrix, this is the system, so it's not a, a one-stop shop, there isn't one product to use for all situations, what they've done is they've created a range of different materials and a range of different products so that, you know, we can choose the best product with the best um, product design for the certain clinical indication. And so if we look, you know, on the left-hand side, We've got a lot of different materials uh, for, for hard tissue regeneration and on the right hand side we've got the, the soft tissue functionality. Um, and it is a system and that, as I've said it's not a one-stop shop. We have particulate materials, we have plate materials, we have block materials, we have 3D customised bone builder materials, we have bone ring materials, um, we have injectable materials. Uh, we've got the membranes, and I'm going to try and keep this very clinical and discuss 
uh, where I would use the majority of these materials and in which clinical situations. So why do we need biomaterials? Because we're, as implantologists, we're all presented with failing dentistry um, and a failing tooth or teeth. And in this situation here, we've got an upper left one that has had uh, an old crown on it for many, many years. And we can clearly see that when that comes out, there's going to be a hard tissue and a soft tissue deficiency. And so we need to be able to manage that. And, you know, this, this poor tooth has had years and years of dentistry. Um, it's potentially going to start affecting the lateral incisor. And so when we take it out, we leave it to heal, you know, we need to leave it to heal for a sufficient period of time to get good soft tissue healing. But there still remains a defect and it's how we manage this defect and with what materials we choose that is critical to the success long term for the patient and for us as clinicians. When we look at CT scan of that defect, you know, OK, there's, there's a good volume of bone there present already. But it's a question of choosing the right clinical technique that when we want to put our implant in there, it's how are we going to deal with that deficient area of buccal plate? So from our, if we think of just ideal biomaterial properties, we want a biomaterial that's biologically similar to host bone, ideally. It's got to be immunologically inert. And from that, I mean, it's got to be biocompatible. So it can't stimulate a, a host tissue response. Um, you know, we don't want it to stimulate any type of inflammatory response. So it needs to be biologically inert. It needs to be dimensionally stable over time. So there's no point putting a material in that is going to resorb over time because we'll ultimately get complications from that. And it needs to have easy handling properties. So it can't be technique sensitive. It needs to be economic because otherwise it won't be chosen by, you know, it won't be affordable um, or relatively economic. And of course, it, it has to be made from a material that is suitable or applicable to the patient's ethical and belief systems. Um, so there are issues that surround bovine, equine, porcine materials. Um, and so these conversations need to be had with patients in advance of utilising the material. And it is a complex interaction between our implant, the host bone that's left, and the bone crafting bone particulate material that we're going to use. And all three need to, to be able to work in synchronisation. So an ideal biomaterial needs to be osteogenic, i.e. it needs to have the ability to form replacement host bone. Osteoinductive as well. So it needs to have the ability to stimulate osteogenesis um, through, through bone morphogenic protein type stimulator molecules. I.e. it needs to be able to draw in the relevant types of of bone formation cells and it also needs to be osteoconductive so i.e that any type of filler material we put in needs to allow host bone to grow on the surface of it against it and within it and it ideally should resorb and allow deposition so the biomaterial should resorb to allow deposition of the host bone now not all biomaterials are going to have all three properties and actually, only um, autologous bone is osteogenic. So in this little slide here, we can see that there are four different types of bone grafting material. Um, we have autogenic bone, which is where the donor and the recipient are the same. So we take a chunk of bone from somewhere within the mouth or the hip or the back of the head, and we fixate it in situ. And so it's the patient's own bone going from a donor site to a recipient site. Then we have allergenic bone where the donor is not necessarily the same individual, is not the same individual as the recipient. However, 
it is human bone. So it is from the same species. So, and, and that's one great product that um, Botus produce and provide for us as implant surgeons. And that's a product property called Max Graft. And that's, uh, we're going to come on to that in a bit more detail, but that's, so that's not an osteogenic material, but it is osteoinductive. Then we have the xenogenic materials, which mean that the donor and recipient are not of the same species, i.e. the bovine, porcine, equine materials. And then we have the alloplastic, which are purely synthetic materials. And each of those different um, properties, even the, e each of those different classifications of biomaterial have different properties. And, and it's getting through this that... Um, you know, choosing the, the appropriate material for the situation is key to long-term success. So my question is, is, auto, is autogenic bone the gold standard? You know, the same donor, same recipient. Now, any of us that have done block grafting uh, procedures for our patients over time know that we have to over-contour autogenic bone material by 25% to allow for graft resorption. And we actually know that graft, autogenic grafts do resorb over time. And there's some research being demonstrated little by little um, on this subject. But it is the only material that has osteoblasts, osteoclasts and bone morphogenic proteins within it from the same donor but it does re does rely on um you know creating a second surgical site on the same patient which often has all the comorbidities and and it is fraught with complexities you know it is they are technically challenging having to deal with two surgical sites in the in the mouth in the oral environment and they're not necessarily um uh, patient friendly procedures they often have a, a lot of swelling and bruising. So, you know, so that's why the, the trend for the xenogenic products, such as Cerebone, the allergenic products, such as Max Graft, and the alloplastic products, such as Max Resorb, are becoming more and more commonplace and, and routine. So, as we said, the autografts are osteogenic, osteoconductive, and osteoinductive. Allografts are osteoconductive and osteoinductive, and xenografts and alloplasts are just merely osteoconductive. They're uh, just uh, a scaffolding material. So with the allografts, there is um, there are materials that will enhance bone formation within the processed what was human bone. All of these products need to be all hard tissue products, scaffolding products need to be common need to be covered with a membrane to prevent tissue inclusion. And Jason membrane, a porcine membrane, um, it has a long barrier function uh, and, it's, and it's really, you know, it's got good data with it and it's certainly a product that I enjoy using and have used for many years now. Um, so it's, it's quite a tactile material. So once it's wet, you know, it's easily manipulated. And you'll see lots of clinical, clinical use. You know, we're going to get to the, the clinical cases and, and you'll see lots of it being used. And it's not, you know, it's just a great material. So how do we decide which biomaterial when? So K. Howe produced this classification of bridge morphology post-extraction. So if we look at um, how to classify a ridge in terms of when do we decide which biomaterial when, Kaywood and Howe formed uh, this classification in terms of ridge resorption and remodeling following tooth extraction. And if we look at a class one like ridge is where we have bone supporting a tooth, so it's a dentate ridge. Class two is post extraction, so we take a tooth out, the, the ridge remodels and we still have a fresh kind of socket. Class three is a well-rounded ridge form with adequate height and width. 
Class four is a knife edge ridge form with adequate height but inadequate width, typically with fused cortical plates. And classification five is a flat ridge form, inadequate in height and width. And class six is a depressed ridge form. Um, this is quite extensive grafting, typically required with some, uh, you know, right the way down to basal bone. And so what I want to do is just demonstrate through these cl classification um, cases, some demonstrate some cases with using this classification um, of where I would use certain materials and when. So if we look at a type one case, which is an immediate placement, um, so tooth taken out, you can actually consider using an autogenic material, autogenous bone material. So here I have a tooth root. We take it out using a minimally invasive extraction technique. Make sure we curette out any uh, granulation tissue. And using a Strauma BLT um, implant burr, you can actually collect quite a lot of autogenous chips from the osteotomy site. And these autogenous chips we can, uh, you know, reuse in as part of our implant placement protocol. So we can place our implant and then on the buckle and the palatal surface, we can fill the sites, the defects uh, around the implant between the bony walls and the implant surfaces with the autogenous chips. And in this situation, we can immediately load because we've got good fixation and that will form a good clot um, and, and that will stabilize a good clot for bone formation underneath the temporary crown and around the implant. However, we know that autogenous chips will resorb and so therefore really those autogenous chips, it's questionable how much osteogenic, osteoconductive, osteoinductive potential they will have. So we can consider using non-autogenous. And in this situation, we've got a, a fractured root, typically an upper, upper post crown. There's no root canal for root canal, you know, uh, treatment with a post crown possible. So we have to remove the tooth and we use a, a minimally invasive technique. And then because the clinical situation is favorable, we can consider placing an immediate implant. There is a good thickness of buckle plate of, of autogenous bone present. And so we can go down our routine implant placement protocol, prepare, place the implant, maintaining good thickness of buckle plate. The implants in situ and there's quite a big gap. So when I consider utilizing a material is when there's a gap of greater than two millimeters, one and a half to two millimeters between the implant surface and the extraction socket. Now we know we're going to get some physiological bone remodeling. So it's important that we want to try and preserve a clot within that extraction site. So this leads us to a choice of which material and why. Now in this case, we know we've got an intact buckle wall, but the gap, but there is a gap. So we need a filler material and we need a volume maintainer. So we know that we're going to get physiological bone remodeling, but we want to stabilize that as much as possible. And of course, with um, BOTIS, we have a, a vast array of different materials. So in this situation, a particulate material, which is the bottom circle, would be the material of choice. So that would be Cerebone, Max Resorb or Max Graft are our particulate granular choice of materials. Now, in this situation, I would typically use Max Resorb. And that's because it's a nanoplastic material. So it's completely synthetic and I'm not relying on it to form host bone. What I want to do is use it as a tissue filler whilst the implant becomes stable um, and the soft tissues can mature around our temporary crown and, and it just needs to hold a bit of volume for us. So it's, it's purely a, like a volumizer. You know, primary immediate placement, immediately loading, 
Sutured closed. That's our temporary crown in situ. That's it repaired. But looking at the soft tissues, we can see that the soft tissues are nice and healthy and pink and remodeling. And then in this situation, we've got a, you know, a ceramic abutment on. And we can cement a crown in situ because the angulation and that's our, our definitive restoration. I don't know. I guess probably six months to a year later. And the soft tissue is, is very healthy. Now, what we can see is sometimes in cases like this, where we're just using a max resorb as a volumizer, is a little bit of uh, biomaterial just coming through the gum. And I've not used a I've not used a membrane in this situation because I'm not I'm not really expecting the material to be there to form a bone-like substance because that's the role. Um, of the extraction socket is to support the implant. This is merely to try and support the soft tissue while it matures and develops. And so then that's a year later at review and it's a nice stable situation. So Maxresorb, as I said, is an alloplastic graft material. It is patient friendly because it's, it's a fake material if you like. It's made in a laboratory. Um, I would say it does have questionable long-term data if you're trying to compare it to other um, long-term materials. But what it does do is it maintains a blood clot and it allows hard and soft tissue to form locally. And it does have very straightforward handling properties. So in this situation that I've just shown you, it really is a very straightforward material to use. Um, it's hydroxapatite, beta trichalcium phosphate, um, there are alternatives on the market, and but you know, but really, our Maxisorb is our material of choice. The it's important at this stage. I want to to reinforce that the physicochemical characteristics of biomaterials are not all the same. They vary between the different materials on the market in terms of their composition, their particle size and form, their surface properties. Their osteoconductive potential differs and their resorption capacity differs. And the resorption capacity determines the space available for new bone formation within the defect size. So if we're going to fill a void and we want that to become patient's own bone, then the material has to be able to be resorbed over time to allow deposition of bone into the into this void where the biomaterial has been resorbed and eaten away. And, you know, as you can imagine, not all biomaterials on the market are the same. The reason why I like Max Resorb is because the beta tricalcium phosphate resorbs relatively quickly in, in, uh, in respect to bovine materials such as cerebone. So, you know, but you've got to have to bear that in mind because if it does resolve very quickly, then you can't use it in an indication where you want bone to form for the long term. And we'll come to that. So just to reinforce with another case, we've got a failed root, failed core to a crown, immediate implant placement, <clears throat> fill the gap with the max resorb. And again, a, a very simple handmade temporary crown chair side to just fill the, the defect. And it works very nicely. <clears throat> and we can see that, as I described from the outset, you know, it's biocompatible. We can see nice, healthy pink tissues and that over time it will it will allow, you know, it will absorb away and just allow host hard and soft tissue to form, which is pink and non-inflamed. And that's probably a six month to a year review radiograph. Can see that we get you know very predictable um, results with this material. So now, if we're looking at post extraction sites, it's typically a type kind of a, a delayed placement type. So type two on the ridge classification, then we're going to get some hard bone remodeling, hard tissue bony remodeling, and obviously this is an extreme case where we open the site up. At a later stage, I think this was a case that was referred to me and the extraction hadn't been cleaned out appropriately. And this is what I found at time of implant when I, when I went in. Um, 
you know, th that's a really big defect. Now, this is on the cusp of asking Max Resorb, which is this material, to do the job. However, so in, in uh, as a routine, my choice for this type of defect, where we want the biomaterial to become a bone-like material, I wouldn't necessarily choose Max Resorb in this situation. However, if you've got a patient that doesn't, that chooses not to use a bovine product or a past human product, then, you know, sometimes we're left with little other choice. Um, and it's surprising, you know, we can use, uh, so in this situation, I kind of uh, threw the book at it. So we used a Jason membrane as well. And, um, uh, a bit of so that's the Jason membrane over the top of the Max Resorb, and then M again just for soft tissue healing. Sutured tightly closed, and then two weeks later, you know, really we've got quite a lovely, lovely healthy situation. Nice pink tissues. So if we now look at a, a different situation, whereby you know we're dealing with an aesthetic case. A young lady, she's had post crowns from trauma. She's got external root resorption. Sockets are really quite defective. They're the teeth and they came out. We've got a simple rochette bridging. You know, I anticipate through CT scanning that we're going to be dealing with deficient, you know, thin, thin. Uh, if we've got good buckle plates, it's going to be relatively thin in relation to how it was originally and this is the case so we've got typically eight weeks later soft bone formation but we've got bony defects now here we're looking for a biomaterial that's going to become a bone-like substance to support healthy peri-implant tissues and it needs to be dimensionally stable over time this is a young lady's upper front teeth she's not going to want any gray shine through of the implant surface from a bone uh, replacement material remodeling over time. It's got to be biocompatible and bioinert because we don't want to see red inflammation. We don't want failure of the biomaterial. <clears throat> and the handling properties need to be accurate so that I can rebuild the ridge shape. So this is now where we start considering a long-term biomaterial, which is cerebane. So it's a process that we call contour ridge augmentation where we over thicken with cerebone then we cover with Jason membrane and we can suture it closed and this relies on a, um, a bit more soft tissue management where we're going to <clears throat> have to ensure that we get passive tension free closure and at two weeks suture removal we can see the soft tissue is healing nicely there are implants in place underneath the rochette bridge. And then we get good pink tissues forming. And then once we've developed the emergence profile, using temporary crowns, they can mature. And we can see that we've got, you know, you get little particles of biomaterial start flaking through, but really they're beautiful soft tissues. And then, um, you know, the final definitive crowns a year later, you can see there's a little bit of inflammation from poor plaque control, but actually soft tissue is dimensionally stable and we get a, a good aesthetic outcome. And definitive crowns in situ. <clears throat> so with Cerebane, you know, it is long-term dimensionally stable. So it is a particulate. So there is a risk that our particles will adjust and will um, spread through the soft tissues. And it's an osteoconductive material. There isn't any osteoinductive or osteogenic potential to the material. So if we look at another case, <clears throat> again, we've had old crowns failing. Eight to ten weeks later, we can see soft bone formation in the upper central sites. We prepare our implant site. We put our implants in situ. And then... We re thicken the buckle plate and the buckle wall to protect the implant surfaces for long-term tissue stability. 
and we cover our biomaterial to prevent soft tissue inclusion with our adjacent membrane, trimmed and adjusted, sutured closed, and then that's it. I think that two to four weeks later. So, um, you know, we can see that we get really, really good pink, healthy tissues from this biomaterial. There are implants in situ. And then we can go down our conventional um, protocol of uh, exposure of the implants, fabrication. I'll skip quite a few steps here. Fabrication of a definitive bridge. And that's it. Fit. <coughs> and again, we can see, you know, there is launching of the tissues, but they're nice and pink and healthy. And that will be a very successful long term outcome for this patient. So in this situation, you know, cerebone, we know, um, similar to other bovine materials on the market, it will be there for a very, very long time. And it's, it's well documented in the literature. Uh, this is the, the little bit of history around it. You know, it is bovine. It's from the fem femoral heads of cattle. There is a sintering process. It is, um, you know, it's a closed herd. It's a very safe material. But it takes six to nine months for osteointegration. So if you're utilising it to form a material to support implant, then, you know, it is a very long, uh, there is a very long healing period. Such as this situation where we are dealing with a very resorbed lower anterior ridge, extraction protocol, we take the teeth out, place some very narrow implants, we rebuild the ridge with serotonin, <clears throat> we cover it with Jason, we suture it closed, and uh, six weeks later, we've got beautiful pink tissues. Now, you always get, you know, the odd, you can always get the odd bit of particulate shining through, um, but I think you should all agree that that's lovely pink, healthy tissue just as we want it. And you can't, you wouldn't really necessarily know that there are implants underneath there. There's the exposed implants and the healing caps just come off. Good, healthy, dimensionally stable tissues. So if we now start to get into the more complex sites where we become, uh, we've got loss of width of tissues, we've got sufficient height, but we're losing width. Now we need to consider um, rebuilding more volume of bone material to support the implant. So we have a lower central incisor. We've taken that out. It's got pathology that we curette out. You know, you can see an awful lot of granulation tissue. So we're not going to want to, we're not necessarily going to have the tissues, the hard tissues to support uh, an immediate placement protocol. And in this situation, I always use a delayed placement protocol, allow any granulation tissue to heal. And due, because of the limited bone volume, the lower anterior mandible, taking a guided approach, that's soft tissue, typically eight to 10 weeks later. That's my flap approach. And then we can see that there's quite a significant defect from that preoperative pathology. So in this situation, you know, we've now got to deal with increasing ridge width and we now get into this in this situation of considering block bone grafts, be it only interpositional or particulate, or bone manipulation, be it distraction osteogenesis or ridge splitting and expansion. Now in the lower, lower anterior mandible, we have very few options. We can either block or we can use a particulate material. And cerebone in this situation was my choice. So we placed the implant using our guided approach. We put the cerebone in. We have the Jason over the top to prevent soft tissue inclusion and primary closure. Good passive primary closure. That's our implant in situ. <clears throat> and we can see that again we've got lovely pink healthy tissues now because we're expecting that to form bone the healing time for that is going to be much greater so typically six to nine months then just to show you that with the long-term uh, stability of the material we can get good aesthetic outcomes 
and lovely pink tissue. And that's our, our plant. However, you know, we can now consider using an osteoinductive material, which would be our max graft. So this is a human product uh, that was part of human from either a living um, or a cadaveric donor. And in this situation, we can prepare and place the implant. And we've got a quite a large buckle defect. <clears throat> And you can, you know, yes, cerebone will work very well in that situation, but we have another material that we can consider using, which is Max Graft. Max Graft, which is the part human product, comes in different shapes and forms from Botus, and which is unique. I have used other allergenic products from other companies, but I have to say, hand on heart, Botus is by far and away the best material that I've come across, and you, or best company that offers the best range of materials that I've come across. And We've got particulate for this situation, but there are also the other um, the other forms. And as I said, it's donor bone um, is either living or harvested, and it's either from the iliac crest or the tibial plate. And depending on where it comes from, depends on what properties the bone has, be it cancellous or corticocancellous. And again, it's uh, going to get into too much of a rem it's not quite part of the remit to discuss all the different characteristics to those but just to say this is a cancerous particulate graft from max graft mm -hmm. so because it was human bone it has the ability to be osteoinductive as well as osteoconductive again we cover it with our gelatin membrane and we get good primary closure passive primary closure so as we start having a greater reduction of ridge width. So we have more challenges in terms of rebuilding, uh, in terms of rebuilding. So here we have uh, an upper central incisor where there's a dent being worn for a very long time. The CT shows that we have a very thin ridge. And now this is gonna present a problem in terms of just being able to place an implant and simultaneously um, graft. So in this situation, we need to rebuild the lost jawbone width and then come back and do a delayed implant placement and so here we want to use a material this would have otherwise been conventionally uh, an autogenic um, block graft but now with the fantastic botus max graft blocks we have available we can consider using an, an allograft which means that there's no donor site um, and donor morbidity involved so can see the the large defect here and then this is the max graft block that's hydrated and prepared and what we can do is we can actually fix out a block of allergenic bone in situ screw it into place as we would a conventional autogenic block but actually you know for me it's much nicer for my patients because they don't have to lose a chunk of bone from their wisdom tooth area typically and i can then fill in pieces with our dimensionally stable long-term um, cerebone material, our bovine material. And we can cover that adjacent material to stop soft tissue infiltration. And then we need to get really good passive primary tension free closure. And that's at suture removal. So that's two weeks later. We can see that we've got good thickness of material and the soft tissues are healing up nicely. And actually, on, on the radiograph, you can see the outline of the cerebone particulate, but it's very difficult to determine between the allograft bone and the ho host bone uh, adjacent to it, which shows that it's, you know, it's a pretty good, pretty good material. So that's a CT slice of the block in cross-section, showing good thickness, the rebuilt thickness. And then typically, four months later, we can then, so this is four, months after, four to five months after healing, we can then go back in, and that's our site. And we'll see. So the cerebone, we know, will take six to nine months to heal. But the allergenic bone is already integrated. And so we can place our implant, we can remove our fixation screw, prepare to place our implant, 
add a little bit more serotonin if we need to, add another Jason membrane if we need to, get primary passive tension free closure again, which is critical. And then there's the beautiful soft tissues showing no immunological reaction. And, you know, and we can get a really good definitive crown with nice pink tissues. And we can see that we've got good thickness of bone around our implant with a post-op. So if we start thinking about now type four cases where we're losing height of jawbone as well as width, this is starting to get into very complex graft situations. And in this, in this young rugby player that's lost his upper lateral, he'd worn a denture for many, many years. And there are actually still residual bits of tooth root that was left in situ. As we can see here, um, there's an outline of the extraction socket. I mean, he, he's had a denture for probably about five to 10 years. So I suggest that there granulation tissue within that socket still and when we come to open up we can see there's quite a large defect both um, horizontally but as well as vertically and so then this can bring us to a different technique one that I really enjoy utilizing um, whereby we can use a ring of autogenic uh, of allergenic bone a bone ring technique to rebuild the lost width and height and we run courses through through both this on this, um, whereby we use a trefine to remove a core to create a recipient site. And then we planate it to smooth it. We prepare for the bone ring to fit snugly into. And we have our allergenic bone and we can we can uh, collect the autogenous chips if we want. We prepare um, and this is where the bone ring technique using allergenic bone is super. So this is a material that is both osteoconductive and inductive. Um, and it allows a fixation of a bone ring um, with a simultaneous implant placement. So it greatly reduces um, number of surgeries and healing time. So we effectively put our, put our block of bone in at the same time as placing our implant using our implant to stabilize the block so in this situation we uh, this technique we need to use a trefine to create a recipient site and then we smooth it with a planator and then that's our that's our recipient site ready to receive our bone ring which is hydrated and then you can see that through the middle of our bone ring we're going to use our implant to fixate that in place and so then that's our that's our implant that goes into situ. <clears throat> and then we make sure that we cover that with a cerebone, which is our dimensionally stable over time biomaterial. So that ensures that we're going to get long term aesthetic stability. And we cover the material with our Jason to prevent soft tissue inclusion. And we have to get passive tension free primary closure. Um, which we can see and so then when we come to exposing the implant we can see we've got beautiful pink tissues our implant in situ um, and again you can barely see the differentiation between uh, bone uh, between host bone and wax graft bone and with a definitive restoration we get a lovely post-op solution you know pink healthy tissues <clears throat> So we can also uh, need to consider with type four, when we're increasing vertical height in the posterior maxilla, sinus grafting. And with sinus grafting, again, we're in, an, in a very empty cavity. So we need to consider utilizing a product that's gonna hang around for a very long time. So this is, uh, this is our cerebone, and we can cover this with our adjacent membranes. And this is when I used to use Max, and I still do occasionally, but with quite a big window, we need multiple, multiple membranes. Again, passive tension free closure and nice, healthy pink tissues. And that's our graft in situ, tightly packed. <clears throat> now, the problem with sinus grafting is that we have very little osteogenic potential. When we're working in the sinus, the problem we have is that it's a 
big empty cavity with very little um, healing capacity. So what we want to do is add osteogenic potential to our biomaterials. And in this situation, we can prepare and place our implants and we can consider using LPRPs, LPRF, PRGF systems, add growth factor technology, i.e. osteogenic potential to max graft or cerebone materials, biomaterials. And so we can really add excellent healing capacity to these biomaterials. And so in this situation, I think this was uh, cerebone that we've added osteogenic potential to through utilising the platelet derived growth factors. Um, and then we rebuild it. And again, passive tension free closure around our soft tissue level fixtures. You can see that it remodels very nicely with lovely pink soft tissues. And then we get to the definitive rounds. And so we can actually consider. You know, if we look at, look at this situation whereby we've got very little um, autogenous bone, cortical bone to stabilise our implants, we can add osteoconductive uh, and osteogenic and osteoinductive potential to our biomaterials using PRGF and platelet-derived growth factors, whereby we can add osteogenic potential into the sinus grafting site along with our max graft, which is a fantastic osteo-inductive material um, to rebuild the sinus volume. And so then that's our max graft with osteogenic potential from the platelet-derived growth factor alongside and our tissue level implants. So I just want to say thank you to Botis for, for asking me to do this webinar. And of course, um, as I've just shown, uh, there's lots and lots of useful information through the um, the webinars that BOTUS have got in their online academy. Um, also utilise the ITI and, yeah, I just um, hope this is useful and has, has kept, I've tried to keep, keep it as straightforward as possible for you. So, many thanks. <laughs>